All right, Pittsburgh Steelers fans, it is Monday. It's time for the Monday morning conversation on the Let's Ride podcast, and I'm excited to have Roy Countryman on the show. You might have heard him, actually, last week on the Steel City Insider, but he's joining me now. Roy, welcome to the show. How's it going? I'm doing great, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Uh, kind of making my rounds here as we're getting yeah. into my time of year as it's free agency <laughs> and getting into the draft time. So uh, I love evaluating players, whether it's on the pro personnel side or or even in the college side here, getting ready to do the drafting come April. So it's really the meat and potatoes of my schedule of evaluating. So I love this time. Love coming to talk with you, Jeff. I always appreciate the invite. And you have this, you, you view the game and you view things through a different lens, more so than just an average fan. And so as everyone is kind of maybe getting caught up with the, what's happened over the weekend. One of the biggest storylines among Steeler fans isn't the Super Bowl. It was something that was said by Micah Parsons at Media Row leading up to the Super Bowl when he basically said that the analytics showed that he and Miles Garrett were way better than TJ Watt this past year, and those stats matter. And he's even doubled down on social media. And so this made me, as I as I read through this stuff and I listened to him say what he said on, on uh, Radio Row, I was like, I'm going to ask Roy what he thinks about advanced analytics. Not so much about Micah Parsons' comments because he kind of contradicted himself on more than one occasion. But as someone that evaluates talent, how much do you lean into those advanced analytics? And how much do you say, well, that's kind of overblown and it seems like they're trying to make something out of something that isn't really there. What are your thoughts on the advanced analytics? So it's a hard hard harmony to find uh, the way you use it. So... What, the way I use analytics is, especially with deployments and uh, different alignments when it comes to defensive backs and receivers, uh, it helps be able to show the impact the way they're playing. If you can see that the only the guy only lines up as an X receiver, he never lines up as a slot, you can tell that in an evaluation. It makes it a lot easier. And I use PFF for that sort of stuff. Um, but as far as the double team rates, like he was talking about right. and the pass rush win rate, um, that's hard to quantify because you don't know what the scheme is of the blocking that's going up front. Um, You don't know the type of shifts that they're using and and PFF really doesn't allow for that. It just really allows for, as far as my knowledge is if he wins the one-on-one matchup, it doesn't really take into effect the scheming of how offensive line play against, you know, defenders are because for example, like TJ Watt lines up a lot on second and third downs in a wide nine technique. And he gets chipped by a tight end. Well, they don't always count that as a double team. Yeah. So, yeah, his double team rate's going to be a lot lower for a guy like Miles Garrett that gets shifted inside a lot sometimes on third downs and is beating guards because of his quickness and the size he is. But they're different players. That's the way we got to kind of remember this is uh, we're trying to quantify something you're never going to be able to quantify. You know, it's it's like trying to tell a good chef how how good his food is some of the words in the English language just are not there to, to compliment him to the best way, you yeah. know? And so there's a time and a place for it. And one of the evaluators I learned under uh, Russ Landy always said to use it as a complimentary type thing. You know, it, it should be something that should help prove your point, not be the whole standard for basing your whole point off of, you know, yeah. because I'm always of the, of the form and fashion that, It should just be, you know, checking the box of what you're seeing with your eyes, you know, and that's coming from an evaluator standpoint. So for me, there's a time and place of it. It's just to be the only basis of an argument is is hard to hard to be stand on that platform. Yeah, I mean, it should confirm what you're seeing is essentially what you're saying. And I, I, I like that stance on it because, I mean, TJ Watt had 19 sacks probably would have had 20 if he didn't get injured in week 18 against the Ravens. And you look at the overall numbers and he's, he's a very well-rounded player in terms of people don't talk about pass defenses and being able to get your hands on the football at the line of scrimmage when you're not going to get to the quarterback. He had an interception. He scored a touchdown, like these weird ways of impacting games. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much. I do appreciate your insight on the analytics. I also want to get your thoughts because again, you don't just know the personnel more than the average fan. You also know the coaches better. The Steelers made three official hires uh, at the end of the week last week. What were your thoughts of those new coaches? They hired a quarterback's coach, an offensive assistant, and a wide receiver's coach. Anything stand out amongst those coaches? 
So the the two mostly that I focused on was Tom Arth, the guy we signed from Los Angeles uh, once they switched coaching staffs. I like what he's he has done uh, and his rise coming from, I believe it was uh, John Carroll. Uh, John Carroll, thank you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he's done a lot of good work as far as passing concepts and and be able to sequence, um, you know, trying to put things together uh, in that aspect. So I like that ad in addition to Arthur Smith, because we know how much Arthur Smith loves the running game. So maybe this new up and comer can kind of help, you know, bring him into the, you know, the last 10 years of passing and, and be a complimentary piece there. So I like what he's done. Plus he's had some big names. Uh, he backed up Peyton Manning as a player, and he also has been working with Justin Herbert here. So they have some gravitas when he's talking to a guy in that quarterback room. Um, I'm more interested to see what happens with Mike Sullivan if they bring him back at all. I know that's kind of still up in the air. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how that would work unless it's like a senior advisory role. Um, but because you don't want to, you know, the relationship's already there with Pickett. You don't want, you know, like right. what happened in, with the Panthers this past year, too many cooks in the kitchen. and Bryce Young's not knowing which way is left and which way is right. So yeah. you really want to kind of pare that down. Uh, for how many people is in his ear if it's going to be Pickett for our starter in week one. Now, Azani, the uh, receivers coach, I really like the hire. Good veteran coach. Um, I thought maybe they would explore Heinz Ward a little more, but I'm not sure if there's um, some apropos after the whole last time he was going to try to get the receivers coach job and the whole Antonio Brown thing uh, where he wanted to hold him accountable, but just kind of didn't work out right i don't know what the story is behind that that they didn't really reach out to him but azani has a lot of you know notches on the belt of quality receivers even antonio brown back at central michigan uh i know it didn't go well for him last year but he's a really good wide receiver coach it seems like he's able to purvey his thoughts and actions and kind of keep guys you know, held to a standard. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see that with our receiver group because I think there's a lot of, I don't want to say immaturity, but there's a lot of room for growth in that area. And I I want to see that evolve with this new coaching staff, especially with Arthur Smith. They're going to be asked to block a lot more. It's going to be interested to see the buy-in of, of both of those guys coming <laughs> into this year. I'm sorry. When you say, when you say blocking, I cannot get the – the Indianapolis Colts game and Pickens standing there watching Jalen Warren getting tackled at the goal line and think, oh, this is going to be interesting. But we'll, well see. We'll see. Hey, and the, and I can show you a handful of of tape that where he's blocking mauling True. guys outside. That's what it means. So yeah. for him, I'm not. I don't putting a red flag on that just yet. It's just, I think it's just the awareness of knowing right. every play we got to play like that, not just Absolutely. if it's coming my way or not. I do appreciate the insight on the coaching and with the advanced analytics, but the reason why I asked you on this show was as the Steelers now transition into the new league year. So the new league year starts officially on March 13th, two days prior is when they can negotiate. I love the legal tampering period. They don't call it that anymore, but that's what they used to call it. Right. Which is, boy, is that contradictory. But nonetheless, the Steelers are now putting together their off-season to-do list. And so the team needs is going to change so drastically once free agency starts. So I asked you and I gave you plenty of time to prepare. I didn't want to blindside you with this because it's a lot. Your top, I think I did this last year in the, at the same time with you about the top five team needs. But I want to know, because I did this already on the Let's Ride podcast, top five team needs, but how should they address them? Should it be through free agency? Should it be through the NFL draft? Or should they double dip and try and get both? So I'm curious how these mesh. The only thing I'm going to ask, and I didn't clarify this to you before we went live, was I don't want to be broad and say like offensive line. Let's try and be specific to positions because we do know there's several positions on the offensive line that need addressed with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Are you ready, Roy? Oh, you gave me plenty of time, so <laughs> I can I can I'll just be you know thorough. Look, see, man, I got five. You got five it. Pages. Look at this. Five pages of the notes. Oh my so, gosh. So he is um, more than prepared. Do you want to start at the top? Or do you want to start from one to five or five to one? How do you want to do this? Let's go, let's go one to five because the number okay. five, it, it might be a little bit of a talking point here for us. All right. So, Perfect. Let's start at number one. What's the top positional need for you heading into 2024? So when you asked me to do this, Jeff, I'm looking at it from a front office personnel point. Yes, absolutely. So and the way and the way they evaluate it is they'll put up a big board. You know, some teams do it this way. And they'll literally put up the free agent options and the draft options all on the big board. 
And then it's okay. like, well, where are we going to go with it? So my number one option here is definitely center. I think Ooh. center is one of the weakest spots on our team. Um, it's I love Mason Cole, the person, and he's he's played good enough for us, but good enough isn't going to get us to the Super Bowl. Um, he might get us to the playoff or win the AFC North, but we need to get that next step. And you look throughout the history of the Steelers, we've always had that high-quality stud pivot man. And uh, for me, Cole – his contract is kind of prohibitive at this point. They can save almost $5 million. It's like right around four and a half, four mm-hmm. and three quarters million. If they release him, I wouldn't be surprised being, we kept Pat Meyer. If they restructure that contract, maybe, you know, put it down the line just for familiarity, but it's just as a placeholder, he's going to know he's going to have competition coming in. If they go the free agent route to address it, I'm looking at a guy like Aaron Brewer, from Tennessee, who had a high-quality season, finally shifting into the center. He was a guard for most of his career. Arthur Smith has some familiarity with him as an undrafted free agent and made the team in in year one there. So that could be a guy, if we release Mason Cole, we need that placeholder. Aaron Brewer would be the guy. He has really great athleticism, movement skills. He isn't the bulkiest guy. And those big nose tackles like Michael Pierce would be able to push him around. But we're going to see that wide zone running a lot with Arthur Smith. He would fit that system and what they're looking for as a free agent, but that would be that placeholder. Either him or Mason Cole will be there because the Steelers don't like starting rookies. We've seen it with Broderick Jones last year. Week one, they don't like upsetting the apple cart. They like to see him win through practice, insert him to the lineup here since Tomlin's right. been our coach. Um, now, as far as the draft, you have – this is one of the years that there's just a plethora of centers that are available And it's really going to come down to what the value is at pick 20. JPJ, Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, is an absolute monster. Um, There isn't a lot of weaknesses in his game. If you watch the senior bowl practices, the foot quickness, the power, the strength, the ability to get to the second level, and he's even playing with a hamstring injury in those practices. That would be a player you're probably going to have to grab at pick 20 if you want a center in the first round. Now, we're one of the few teams that value him in the first round but I'm not so sure they can look away from maybe another need as in, in a corner, maybe some other places here, depending on how the board falls. So I'm really the guy for me that I'm targeting is Zach Frazier in the second round. That's where I'm going. Even if I got to make a slight trade up in the second round to make sure I get my guy, he's a four time high school uh, wrestling champ, great hands, great movement ability. He's kind of the one, a one B to uh, Jackson powers, Johnson, as far as centers in this class. And all you got to know is go watch his uh, film of him literally crawling off the field after he broke his leg in the last game in college Mm -hmm. to try to save his team a 10 second runoff um, in that last matchup. That that told me all I needed to know about him as far as heart wise and the way he's going to work as a professional. So for me, it's either going to be Mason Cole on a a restructured deal and Aaron Brew as a placeholder. And we're, I, I would take Zach Frazier as as my next pivot man for the next, hopefully, decade here. You brought it up, and I was going to bring it up even if you didn't. Uh, did the, does the medicals concern you with uh, Zach Frazier? I know he's he's a Mountaineer, and I've, I'm born in West Virginia, so I'm familiar with his game a little bit. But the, the fact that he did break that leg, I'm not sure about like the recovery. I know he was at the Senior Bowl. He did some individual work, but didn't really practice or anything like that. You think that that's 100% healed, not going to be a factor entering the draft? Yeah, and I, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, it's a it was a fractured fibula, I believe. Yeah. Um, he's actually working, I think, with the offensive masterminds right now. He was nine weeks post. Uh, I don't don't believe he had to have any surgery to it. He was nine weeks post. Um, he was already running on a treadmill out there and performing okay. out there. He said that he's probably going to be performing some of the drills at the combine, probably not all of them. But like I said, we don't start rookies year one anyway, so True. we can ease them in. Hopefully get the stopgap, whether it's Cole that takes a reduced deal or Brewer would be our stopgap. But that guy is – you can't lose either way with Jackson Powers Johnson or uh, Zach Frazier. I just think this is the year that even though there is depth, we're going to come away with one of these top two, three centers yeah. in this draft class. All right, very good. Let's go to number two. What's your second position on your team needs list? So the second position uh, need is cornerback. Um it's, it's one that I think we're going to have to double dip at. And it's, you look at our roster, we need both an outside corner and a versatile. That's the way I always class them, not just nickel mm-hmm. corner, but versatile corner. 
uh, that's that can slide inside. So for me, there, I know everybody's clamoring for Lajerry Sneed or Jalen Johnson. I'm not sure. I, yeah, you know me and, and <laughs> Pittsburgh. We never go out and sign a big free agent like that. Not saying Omar Khan couldn't break the the right, tradition, yeah. but I don't believe maybe them guys would even get passed up on the franchise tag. You know, Kansas City has a decision make with Chris Jones and Sneed. Johnson's for sure going to get the franchise tag out in Chicago. Um, so I'm looking at guys as far as the veteran route. Stephon Gilmore. Um, Tomlin's always had a kind of a keenness towards him um, through the draft process and, and throughout his playing career. He's always been complimentary of him. Had a really good season out in Dallas. Um, can maybe have a, a, a decent deal here. You're going to have to pay him pretty well, but not that upper echelon market because he is a little older. And he would be an ideal candidate for that number two corner opposite JPJ, taking on the second receiver, um, still learning with the mentor role with some of these younger guys. Um, and even a guy like Ronald Darby, if you don't want to pay that much to an outside corner, Darby had a quality year and some like 400 some snaps with Baltimore, 10 year veteran, good at playing man coverage, can play zone aggressive in the tackling aspect those guys could be the placeholders for week one that you could get in now as far as versatile guys you have guys like kenny moore from indianapolis that would be more towards that upper end of the money Uh, miles bryant who's a guy that reminds me a lot of mike hilton um he played with new england he played safety nickel really good instincts really good at coming downhill in pursuit or a guy like Nick Needham out in Miami, who's also an unrestricted free agent. If it was me, I would be targeting Stefan Gilmore. I don't know what their plans are with Pat Pete. Uh, you know, they can get a lot of cap relief if they release him. Not sure if they don't restructure that and let him maybe play a little bit of safety this year. I don't know. We're going to have to see what happens there. But we can't go in this year with him being our number two corner. I agree. It's I agree. Just, just not feasible. And you know as well as I do, as we come into the draft season – Steelers don't like going on the draft with glaring needs that just kind of tips our hands when it comes to right. the draft in itself. So I could really see them targeting a guy like Stephon Gilmore just makes a lot of sense with JPJ and him. That would be a pretty staunch, you know, one, two punch. And I think that would be the route they go in veteran is, is to address the outside corner. Now, as far as the draft goes, there's a lot of depth in this class too. Not so much in the first round, but it's at day two, early day three. Um, You have guys like Quinion Mitchell. He's probably going to be in that first round class that after a really steady senior bowl here, showed his skills translate against Power 5 conference players. A guy like Ennis Rakestraw Jr. from Missouri, big physical corner, can play man coverage, isn't afraid to come downhill. Um Jarvis Brownlee Jr., also from Louisville, had a great senior bowl week. Really flies downhill. Transferred from Florida State. Just a really feisty kind of corner as an outside guy. Brownlee Jr. is actually the guy I would target if you're looking for more of the outside guy on day two, day three area. Um, And then a guy like Quantes Stiggers. I know I wrote about him for a gym over at 24-7. Could be one of the first players to be drafted that never played college football. Um, and played up in the CFL and played in the East-West Shrine game. He was kind of raw technically-wise, but he's got everything you want in a corner. So maybe you go out and sign a guy like Stephon Gilmore, bring this kid along, teach him the way underneath of him. Um, So that would be one of the outside corners. If you're looking for the more versatile defensive backs that we could get to play slot, maybe some dime, uh, Mike Sanders still is, is the upper echelon guy in the draft from Michigan. He made plays all over the place for the Wolverines. Um, The brother of one of the receivers of Green Bay Packers, Bo Melton, Max Melton from Rutgers. Another one, he played a lot of outside corners, probably got the shift inside. Um, Great speed, great physicality there. Um, Two guys that I really like. One guy shined out in the East-West Shrine, Dadrian Taylor Demerson. They just call him Rabbit uh, from Texas Tech. This guy... He reminds you of a mini Tyran Matthew. He's just all over the place, chirping at people, um, really high-quality IQ. That would be the guy I, I target maybe in the third, fourth round. He's just – he seems like that spark plug that would be great opposite Minka Fitzpatrick, you know, in that secondary to add to it. Whether he can drop down, play nickel, he can play over the top if you need to. Just gives your defense coordinator a lot of variety that he could play around with. So – 
if I'm looking at corners and guys that I, I would maybe be targeting, Jarvis Brownlee Jr. for outside corner at draft. And like I said, Rabbit, Dadrian Taylor Demerson uh, as my versatile guy. I do have to ask you, since we're on the cornerbacks, what are your thoughts on like a Corey Trice? I, it's tough. He had a he had a really bad knee injury in college at Purdue. He had another one in training camp last year, and also Darius Rush, who was signed midseason. Do any of those two prospects are are they just hey, you're gonna you're gonna be in camp and you're gonna be fighting for a job, or does and did any of them show you anything? I know that obviously with Trice, it's minimal with it, his time at training camp. Did any of them show you anything like you know what? There might be something there that the Steelers could work with. Yeah, Trice really impressed me in training camp. I, I think he's going to get a legit shot at at making the roster. Um, I think they were excited by his upside. I think they were surprised they got him as late as they did, and a lot of it had to do with those medicals you talked about. Uh, the good thing, I believe, his knee injury wasn't to the same knee. So oh, yeah. that I, I'd have to double-check on that. Don't hold me to it, but I don't right. believe it was to the same knee. So. Now we're not getting the degenerative talk that you talk about if you injure the same knee multiple times. That length and physicality always translate. We've seen players be able to bounce back from those knee injuries uh, a lot better. He has the right mentality and working back. So I wouldn't just, you know, forget about him yet, but I also wouldn't be counting on him either. That would be just like my lottery ticket winnings that I'm playing on if he winds up being a productive member. The guy that I was more intrigued with was Darius Rush. And I think you can see the excitement they got after elevating him and signing. And he made a nice pass breakup late in the season as well when he got some playing time. He has a lot of translatable skills to an outside corner. And I think that's why you're going to see them maybe take a chance on a veteran outside guy to give these two plus Joey Porter a chance to learn from him have that placeholder and whether it's a draft pick or or whatnot to help them get an opportunity, yeah. it's going to buy some time for them to figure it out. Also a guy not to uh, forget about is Luke Barku as well um, from the, it was an XFL signing yeah. and then got a chance. He's a really good playmaker when the ball is in the air. Uh, he just needed to add some bulk. And there's a reason why he stayed on the practice squad all last year. Uh, so don't forget about Luke Barku either. And that, that might be the one sneaky guy out of that trio that they look to to maybe one of them out of the three make a make a move forward to a roster spot, maybe a future starting spot there as well. I remember you bringing up Barku last year around this time, so that's a good call. What's what's your third team need here? All right, so my third team need um, is offensive tackle, um, and these top three needs can kind of be interchangeable. I believe center and corner are the more pressing needs, but. I think tackle for more of the long-term vision is one of those ones that you have to invest in. Yeah. Uh, we've seen Broderick Jones last year. We, especially with Andy Weidel now in the front office, we're going to be building through the trenches. Uh, Dan Moore's play is just simply not conducive to playoff caliber winning football. As long as it stays at the level of the last two years, it's not. Uh, he's a nice player, good hard worker, but there's a reason why Kenny Pickett was ready to run for his life. Uh, within five to six seconds. And it was usually off of the left yeah. side of the formation. Um, I love Dan Moore. I got to talk to him a few times. It's just, there's difference between college and NFL. And he's a great swing tackle. I think I know he hasn't had a lot of experience at right, but we need a guy, whether it's Broderick Jones, we're going to move over to left. I'm not saying we have to do that, but it's really going to be, what is the board going to tell us as far as draft wise? Free agency wise, I don't see us going out. I know everybody's saying, well, we got to go out and sign Makai Becton or Jonah Williams. Just the same as a corner. We don't go out and sign big name free agents. That's that's not our game. You know as well right. as I do, Jeff. We develop, yeah. re-sign. You know, that's the way we do business. Two guys that I'm looking at, and there was a guy I pounded the table for last year, um, Jason Peters. I know he's 42 years old. I'm fine with that. If you watched him play out in Seattle this past year, and the year before at Dallas, he's willing to play guard now. He's played right tackle. He played left tackle last year in Dallas. The amount of information that man has alone would be like another assistant offensive line in our group. And even if he don't make the team, our offensive line is going to be better for that. Just in the preparation style. Broderick Jones being able to soak up his wisdom, the athleticism that Peters had to have, and the working ethic that he had to do from translating to a tight end to a tackle. It, it needs to be there. So that would be my under-the-radar guy to kind of target. Um, Andy Weidel's 
knows him personally from whenever he was in Philadelphia. So there's some familiarity there. You're, he's not going to be very expensive. Um, that would be my placeholder guy, maybe to target in free agency, just to try to help out the the younger players there with some knowledge and boosting their morale. If you're looking more for a guy that can actually start and maybe even be our swing tackle here in 2024, a guy like George Fant, who started at right tackle for the Texans after their right tackle, Titus Howard, went out. He played really well for the Texans down the stretch. So if you're looking for a guy you want to maybe push both Moore and uh, Jones, George Fant's probably your guy. Now, if the cost is too prohibitive, you might look at a way in Jason Peters, that veteran really knowledgeable guy that can mentor the younger ones for sure draft wise it's going to be hard to pass up a tackle for at 20 we all know that tackles don't grow on trees although this year a lot like center there's a lot of depth throughout uh, this is one of the best tackle classes i've ever evaluated as far as the amount of depth that you're probably gonna get starters all the way through day two, maybe even early day four or wow. early day three into the fourth round. Now they might not be day one starters, but you're going to get starters into that day three, just the amount of depth that we have here. And a guy that I really like is Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma. He's a former tight end from TCU uh, played at Oklahoma here. Tomlin was really keen to his practice reps down there at the senior bowl, watched him very intently and, um, pulled him aside after reps and was introducing himself, kind of giving him some tips about how to do the drills and whatnot. So you're probably going to be able to see him still on the board at 20, just because he's pretty, he needs some refinement as far as hand usage and, and technically wise. Um, but you got guys like JC Latham from Alabama or the kid from Georgia, Marius Mims, who's only, I believe had less than 10 starts, but when you put his tape on, he's an absolute monster in the run game and, and, very efficient in pass protection. So in first round selections, that's what you're talking about in the round 20. So Jeff, we're talking about top three needs. You're going to be weighing Jackson Powers Johnson, Quinion Mitchell, and maybe a guy like Guyton at pick 20. And it's really, where can I find my value in this draft class? Can I find another tackle that I think has the upside of Guyton at maybe the second round? Or do I take my center here now and then grab a set a tackle or a corner in the second it's it's really going to be what how the board plays out. I yeah. think is what it's going to happen here. So, all right, hey, you bring up Peters. It reminds me of when they signed Flozell Adams. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like that veteran that's been there, done that. There's nothing I haven't seen, and it's probably going to be on the cheap because he wasn't a, a sought after free agent this year. Anyways, I like that move, and I just don't think the Steelers can go into next season with Dan Moore even as a potential candidate. It, we've just seen enough. I see again, swing tackle. Sure. You can't have him slotted at your left tackle. If you take yourself seriously. All right. What about number four? What's your fourth team need? Well, and I'll say this too, Jeff, just to close up on tackles. Sure. I don't think if it's a, if we're going to take a tackle, I think it's just a more of when, when yeah. we're going to take a tackle in this class with the amount of depth that's there. It's just, when are we going to take them? That's so, a good point. Okay. Fourth, fourth uh, need right here linebacker um i hated to see what happened with cole holcomb um was playing really well starting to find his groove um we only signed him to a three-year deal that's the thing we got to remember with him so where is he at physically i know they're expecting him to be back uh, i believe during training camp but he's gonna have the same explosiveness you know what's gonna happen quan alexander's a free agent another season ending injury to him landon roberts was a warrior playing yeah. through injury and I think that's really the building block going forward uh, as the leader of that defense. But he doesn't have the greatest athleticism, but that's OK. We, we sometimes that's overrated as far as we need in our second level defenders. So this one might be this one could be up for debate where we're going to get into um, free agents. Patrick Queen is out there. Devin White and a white they're really interested in the year we trade up to get Devin Bush. I think both of those guys costs are going to be too prohibitive for us to go get them. Um, you have a guy like Willie Gay Jr. from Kansas City, really good ball player, has really evolved throughout his time. I know he dealt with some mental uh, health issues, and he's really got himself together and has been playing high-quality ball in Kansas City. Still think his cost might be a little too high after we just invested in Holcomb. Um, there's a couple guys, though, in that, in that next level. One is Bobby Wagner. Played out of his mind this year, still with Seattle. Um, had over 130 tackles, I believe, five sacks, 
vintage Bobby Wagner season. We have an inside with him, with Aaron Curry being his former position coach. If he's looking for that late career, let's maybe go on a playoff run, we might be able to snag him and bring him to Pittsburgh if the cost isn't too prohibitive. So I wanted to give you a target maybe in that under-the-radar veteran that yeah. we can come in. Him and Elena Roberts would be outstanding at the second level um, on that defense. Two guys that are the younger ones, Isaiah Simmons. He was traded from the Cardinals, former fifth overall pick. Played for the Giants a lot on special teams this past year. But when he did get the reps as a starter and a lot of in the sub package, played really well for the Giants in that aggressive downhill pursuit once he finally settled at linebacker. I know Arizona switched him back to safety and it was been messing with his head. But if you look at his physical attributes and his testing numbers, they're not far off of what Shea's ears were. Now, his yeah. instincts aren't as what Shea's ears are. But I'd like to see him on a flyer in this defense. You know, the positionless third down packages. Isaiah Simmons seems like that would be the kind of James Ferrier esque move. You know, former first round pick, been been kind of neglected and, and miscast in different systems. And I think his his upside would be out, outrageous in our defense. Yeah. Just being able to have other aggressive uh pass rush and linemen in front of him eating up blocks. He's a guy. Or Jeremy Chin, uh, safety linebacker from Carolina. They're both available. Could, I really think they would be that positionless dime packer, dime backer, you know, linebacker beside Elaine and Roberts could make a lot of impact on sideline to sideline, coverage backer, do a lot of different things and not break the bank. You know, Chin will probably be a more expensive guy because he has more production. Um, be really high quality ads there for both of them uh, in free agency. Draft wise, it's linebackers one of them positions this year. It's like, I really hope you don't have a need because it's kind of throw something at the wall and let's see what we get to stick. There's really two guys, maybe three guys that are the upper echelon talents. And I'm not sure any of them are first round picks. So you have guys like Peyton Wilson Jr. Or excuse me, Peyton Wilson from NC State. Freak athlete. Uh, I told Jim on our podcast that he reminds me a lot, you know, tenacity wise of T.J. Water, Nate Herbig. Not saying the player, but just that outrageous impact, like I can just take over a game at some points. Peyton Wilson is a really quality linebacker, both as a run defender and as a pass defender. But he has a long, and I'm saying a long injury history. So that's what's going to be the real question with him. Knee injuries, shoulder injuries. Had The last year, though, he was healthy. So that that's the one thing you can hold yeah. for him. Um, okay. Edron Cooper from Texas A&M, uh, Tomlin and, and the Steelers uh, showed a lot of interest in, in him in the Shrine Bowl. Uh, explosive mover, downhill force, not so sure about his coverage skills, but he is a high-quality athlete. He'd be one or the uh, son of Jeremiah Trotter. Jeremiah Trotter Jr. from Clemson is also here. A little bit undersized, but is a downhill triggering linebacker. Decent instincts and in zone coverage. But you're looking at all these guys are probably second, third round, uh, especially with Wilson. I think he's a first round talent, but the medicals are probably going to force him to be a little bit lower. I, I like how you had that fourth because it just seems like anymore in, in today's NFL and today's college game, that it's such a hybrid role playing inside linebacker. You have those thumpers and then you have the coverage guys. You just don't have those guys that do it all very much anymore. So I like the free agent options you mentioned, especially Simmons. I think he's a very intriguing get. And if you have him with an Landon Roberts, who is more of your traditional inside line, I think it could be a good fit. And again, like you said, the draft class isn't that great. But what about your fifth one? You said this could be controversial. I'm anxious to hear what your fifth position of need is. Yeah, so I saved this one for last just because I couldn't put it at number one. It's definitely quarterback. <laughs> um, and, and I've been I've been going back and forth in my mind, been watching tape of different guys, both on the pro personnel side and the college side. And I I'm not sure what this what this team's going to do. It's going to be that's going to be the whole talk of the whole off season. Kenny Pickett. Uh, I mean, I think the benching is maybe what's best for him long term in his career. I'm not so sure they give Mason Rudolph a contract. I know they've been saying the right things in the media. Yeah. Uh, he he played well down the stretch. I'm not saying that he'd be playing well enough to be the week one starter because uh, I think we can do better. 
Uh, but you see guys like Kirk Cousins. Am I going out to spend 40, 45 million on a guy that's coming off a Achilles injury? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But you look at our roster, that's the thing you look at from a, a GM perspective and even Tomlin's perspective is a lot of my players are more on the 30 plus side, especially on defense, or they're getting around that magic number of 30. Even some of my offensive pieces we we renewed the um youth on that side but by the time they're going to be in their you know <laughs> prime of their career prime yeah. of their career we're going to need defensive pieces right. so do you go out and add a guy like that that you try to pay off the veterans on the the defensive side and get us over the hump to get to the super bowl i i'm not so sure they're going to take a swing at kirk cousins that's that's too much money but me and my one friend were talking about quarterback options here and he brought up Russell Wilson and I don't know what happened in Denver. Uh, I mean, I'm not a huge Sean Payton fan and I think Payton's going to pretty much trash their salary cap for the next three to four years because they are going to release Russell Wilson. Yeah. I love Russell Wilson as a player and love what he, what he does off the field. He's a Walter Payton man of the year winner, uh, just like Cam Hayward. I think that might be the guy we go out and target. I think we might see a veteran. Um, I mean, the gravitas, you could you could purvey that to Pickett and saying, we got a Super Bowl caliber winning quarterback that you're going to compete with. And that's the one option this year that you can maybe make that statement is, okay, Russell Wilson's contract with Denver when he gets released will be around $35 million, I believe. They'll be on the books for. Yeah, There's offset language in that. So Russell Wilson ain't going to do them no favors after the way they treated him. No, Let's just be that. honest with that. Yeah. So Russell Wilson's going to take a forget you deal and it'll be, he's vet minimum contract will be $1.21 million this year. Who can the Steelers add for $1.21 million to compete for a starting job with a Super Bowl ring? Not many. <laughs> and, now the offensive system that we're running with Arthur Smith aligns a lot with what Seattle did in his prime downhill running game, play action, let him do his thing after the play breaks down to me. I, I didn't want to say this is the route they're probably going to go, but I think it makes way too much sense that Russell Wilson is, if it was me, I would be adding him to the equation. Now that's with the caveat of saying you still got to win the job. Yeah, because that cost also allows them to say, Kenny, you won the job and we can release Russell Wilson or trade him at the end of trading camp and be none the wiser or another team that may be in a quarterback need. So it's kind of a win win situation. It's not that over the top saying, Kenny, you know, we're done with you. Right. But and I went back and watched Wilson's film from this past year. His demise was greatly exaggerated. Um, he played quite well in Denver this year for a situation that was needless to say, hot garbage. Um, as far as schematically wise on offense, you could tell it was, it, it was two systems and, and, and a head coach and a player that just simply didn't see eye to eye and they were trying to make it work. But then it, you, you know how this, the, it went to oh, the yeah. end of the season, but I don't see them drafting a quarterback early. If they go in the draft wise, I don't see them going early. Other free agents, I mean, if we don't re-sign Mason, I could see Tannehill coming just because of the familiarity Right. as a backup. Kind of the same thing with Russell Wilson, but Wilson has that next level of resume that I don't think Kenny could say anything if you bring in Russell Wilson. And you yeah. you project it to him as beat him out. And, and the Steelers, the Steelers could do something that they really never did under Kevin Colbert ever. And that is they could make the number look great for Russell Wilson. They could say, we're going to bring him in on an $80 million deal. It could be over however many years, whatever it could be all incentive based. Like the guaranteed money could be absolutely yeah. minimal. Cause like you said, he's going to say, screw you to Denver. You're owing me every dime yep. of that contract that you gave me when I went there. So now I go to Pittsburgh and if he doesn't play, if he doesn't win the job, he doesn't hit those incentives, and therefore he doesn't owe that money. The Steelers don't really do those type of deals. I'd love to see them get into that, especially at the quarterback position, because it's a lower risk move than it is guaranteed money a la Deshaun Watson. So 
what so the draft you're saying it's it's a middle to to late round type of guy i don't yeah. know I'm, I'm thinking like a chris oladokun but i would hope it'd be someone with a little bit more upside yeah as as far as that i mean if if we don't take a guy i mean i i think we're gonna add a veteran either way i'm not yeah. so sure like i said mason draft wise if i'm looking at at, at a guy that I want to beat out Kenny Spencer Rattler's my guy. Um, I thought he played well down in the sec after the, uh, him transferring from Oklahoma and the Caleb Williams ordeal there. Mm -hmm. Um, Spencer Rattler has the moxie, the arm talent. He's not afraid to look down the gun when he's under pressure and make a, make a play. So Rattler's my guy on day two. If I want to take a quarterback day three guys, I mean, I'm a sucker for arm talent. So give me Joe Milton. I, I don't care. I, I'm going to take that that swing for the fences at a guy at 6'5", 260. Um, looks like Big Ben physically wise and can yeah. throw a ball 90 yards. If I'm taking an upside swing, I'm taking a guy like that um, for my guy to develop behind Pickett and, and see what they can do. If not him, if you're looking more for maybe an upside backup, maybe spot starter, Jordan Travis is a nice prospect too. He just is more apt to be a runner than a passer. Um but I, I like Milton's upside if you're looking at a day three player, just that howitzer of an arm. Plus, he's built for the AFC North, bad weather, big hands, um, running abilities. And, and it would be fun to see him throw the ball down the field to Pickens. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's something the Steelers are going to want to do more this year is take some more shots. Say you saw it with Mason Rudolph in the post Canada era in the 2023 season. Take shots down the field. Give your playmakers an opportunity to make a play. So we'll see how that goes. All right, there you go, Roy. Thank you very much, man. So number one need center, second need cornerback, third offensive tackle, fourth inside linebacker, and fifth quarterback. I absolutely love it. I thank you for your time. Why don't you plug what you're doing right now for both your website, social medias, all that stuff. So you can catch my work at prospectencyclopedia.com. I have an off-season database to get you familiar with all the moves got cap space uh, information. It's got uh, draft capital. I'll be having some mock drafts here dropping soon. Has my draft rankings on. Uh, has a little bit of everything um, for my company, Big Country Scouting. But it's prospectencyclopedia.com. You can find me at Twitter or X, whatever they call it anymore. At Preacher Boy Roy, always a, always uh, willing to talk football. You know, just like yeah. Jeff always has me on here. Hit me up. We'll do some chatting. And uh, thank you again, Jeff. And just one other thing before we go. Sure. Congratulations, Cam, Ham Cam Hayward. Yes. Uh, and your family, Charlotte and uh, Connor, for the uh, Walter Payton Man of the Year. Couldn't have went to a better player. Couldn't have said it better myself. Roy, thanks. We'll talk again probably before the draft. Take it easy. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff.